Praise God. Well, we've been in a series uh, talking to you about uh, God works in atmospheres. We're going to continue on with that today. And we have brought you a number of things. Number one, it's a real revelation to know that He is uh, often bound by the circumstances that are created by people and events and things of that nature. Um, you could go through so many things and so many illustrations of it, and we won't for time's sake, but we've tried to give you some things that allow you to know what kind of atmosphere that he'll work in, not just in church, but in your personal life. There are things, if you do certain ways, you're going to get a visitation from God, much more likely. Amen. So we talk to you about praise and worship. We talk to you about faith. We talk to you about a number of things. But this being the week that it is, this is Thanksgiving week. And so we're going to take a little other turn in our study on atmospheres. And we're going to talk to you about God works in an atmosphere of thankfulness. So it's important for us to create an atmosphere of thankfulness. Everybody say thankfulness. Thank now, I want you to turn with me in your Bibles. You do have your Bible, don't you? Yes. You need your Bible. You need to get comfortable with your Bible. Now, your Bible needs to be something you have with you all the time. Now, we can take them now by phone or iPad or however we do it. A lot of ways now, but be comfortable with your Bible. And I think it's important to have a, a book, a book not just a phone or whatever, that you can write in and mark in and it becomes you. And you put your thoughts, you know, right in the margin. If you got, if your Bible's too expensive to mark in, go get you a cheap one. But get you one you can mark up. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Now in the book of Luke chapter 17, there's a story here. We'll begin in verse number 11 and we'll spring from there into our you know, and some to, to some additional things. But in Luke chapter 17, verse number 11, and it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him 10 men that were lepers, which stood afar off. Now, the reason they had to stand afar off because they were unclean and society did not allow them to mix and mingle. And there were certain ways that they had, to, you know, some used a bell or various things, but they, in some cases, would have to cry out, unclean, unclean, because they were ostracized from the society they were in because it's a contagious thing that can be transmitted. And uh, not super can contagious, but contagious enough that they have to go into isolation. And so not only do they lose their health to the disease, they also lose their fellowship and their association with friends and family because of the problems that are created by it. So that in and of itself is pretty bad. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So they said to Jesus what they wanted. And, you know, sometimes we beat around the bush a little bit too much and we need to just get right to the point. And if you say, if you need mercy, tell him, give me mercy. Now that word mercy right there means compassion or pity. That's what it means. And so they asked Jesus to have compassion on their situation. And when he saw them, he said unto them, go show yourself unto the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. Now, Nothing took place until they acted on what God told them, what Jesus told them. He said, now go show yourself to the priest. And nothing happened until they began to follow and obey that instruction. They weren't healed before, and then they're going to go show themselves to the priest. They begin to move toward obeying that word, and as they went, that healing came to them. Now, there was a reason that they had to go show themselves to the priest. Now, you find in Leviticus 14, and I won't read it for time's sake, and it's a little tedious how it's written in there, but you'll find that there were certain things that a leper, 
if he'd go show himself to the priest that had to take place and the and the priest they they had to they had to shave their head they had to shave their eyebrows they had to, there's a whole bunch of things they had had to do and uh, i guess it's for future contamination or whatever but anyway they had to do a bunch of things and they also had to give an offering you say well why would they have to do that because that was a part of their thankfulness to the lord for what he had done for them and you can find it outlined clearly in Leviticus 14, what a leper would have to do to be declared clean to the community. And so he could re-engage in the society he had been ostracized from. Amen. And so he told them to go show yourself unto the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, and so cleansing equates to healing. In this case, cleansing and healing was one and the same. Amen. 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 And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. And he fell down, down on his face at his feet and giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answered and said, we're there are not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? They are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And uh, the word whole there is the word that we use if we say a person is saved. You know, when a person gets born again, we use the word saved. He's saved. The word saved in the Greek is the word sozo, sozo, but it's, it's, it's pronounced like it's got a D in it. Sozo. That's the way you pronounce the word. And what that word means is made whole in every part of your life. Spirit, soul, body, financially, socially. It's the... Uh, Hebrew word shalom. When we say shalom or peace, that means every part of you, every part of whom you say that to, if you say be blessed, that's what you're saying. I, I bless you in the name of the Lord. And I am saying to you, be whole in every part of your being. Nothing broken, nothing missing, nothing out of sort, nothing out of place. That's what that word means. So there were 10 that he spoke to and told them to go show themselves to the priest. And as they went, they received their healing. So here they are healed of leprosy. Now, leprosy is a, a diabolical disease. It's an insidious malady. And sometimes because people lose feeling in their fingers and in, in toes, their extremities, they'll actually injure themselves and can't feel it. And so in many cases, they, they don't have fingers. And, and a lot of that's gone. And now the disease itself will do that. But there's more than just the disease at work. It's what it brings. And so here these people are scarred from leprosy. But now they're suddenly healed. And so they can re-engage into society after they go show themselves to the, to the priest and get declared clean. But this one came back and he began to say, thank you, Lord, or he gave thanks to the Lord. Now we're talking about creating an atmosphere of thankfulness or thanksgiving. And when this one came back and gave thanks to the Lord, not only was he healed of the leprosy, and in, we have no indication that the other nine got their fingers back. We just know the leprosy was stopped. But in this case, this man was made whole. So he got back whatever was lost. And I wonder how much income you'd lose over the years. Through not being able to work. 
So when Jesus said be whole, he wasn't just talking about his body. He's talking to every part of his being. And so thankfulness to God created an atmosphere where he could completely be restored, nothing missing, nothing broken. Now, thank God for the nine that got healed from leprosy. But this guy not only got healed from leprosy, he got restored to his former condition and above that. Now, that's what God said here. So an atmosphere of thankfulness creates an environment where God can do more than otherwise could possibly happen. When we're thankful to the Lord, it opens doors that no other thing we could do could open. People who are unthankful have a difficult time receiving from God. Now, thankfulness, even though it's in this case obviously directed to God, but you find it manifested in relationships. Because I think that what we practice in one area, we'll practice in another area. And so you see people who are unthankful in general. They don't say thank you. That's common in society. And as a matter of fact, you know, we're, we're such a liberated society. In many cases now, if you hold the door open for a woman, she'll get mad at you because, you know, you're declaring she's weak or something like that. No, there's just a need to be courteous. I mean, you know, there's nothing wrong here. We're not, we're not putting anybody down. But, you know, society has robbed us from common courtesies that ought to be a part of how we live. And to say thank you to somebody is the right thing to do. A person who doesn't know how to say thank you is really not deserving of future blessing. You know that just in common life. Amen. Thankfulness opens the door to blessing, not just from God, but to, to and from one another. You want to do more for people who are thankful for the attention or maybe the provision or maybe the blessing, whatever case that you've brought into their life. Now, we don't give to one another just so we can get an attaboy or a praise. The Bible says to give expecting nothing in return. So you may get a thank you and you may not, but that doesn't stop you from being generous because that's who you are, period. But it does make you feel better when somebody appreciates your sacrifice. You know what I'm saying? I mean, uh, I'm not saying we only give for that, but we, 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 we enjoy our process better if people appreciate what we do. Don't you think? Well, that nature of how you feel about that is put in there by the Spirit of God. That's, that's the God inside you that causes you to feel that way. And so we have to be careful to make sure we're thankful people. We have to make sure that we give thanks to the Lord for his goodness. We're talking about creating an atmosphere that God can move in your life. We need to be thankful people. Everybody say thankful. Now, his thankfulness created the conditions, the atmosphere in which Jesus worked and made him completely whole. That's a wonderful thing. Amen. So thankfulness creates an atmosphere in which God will work. By the same token, unthankfulness creates an atmosphere in which God will not manifest. I mean, you just have to conclude that. If thankfulness brings his blessing, brings his moving in our person's life, then unthankfulness will stop it or hinder it. Amen. And so we need to practice being thankful. Say practice thankfulness. And we need to do it on all, on all sides. Amen. I mean, if a person lets you out in traffic, give them a wave. You know, it's just a small token. But don't you want to do it more when people appreciate what you've done? Yeah. You know? and, and so in, in our little community down there where we, you know, go home and little area down there, it's a little 
you know, shopping center type area. And uh, there's all kinds of people coming in and going out and all that. It's just one of those little places, you know. And uh, you have to always let somebody cross in front of you, get caught by a light, you know, let them cross over and whatever. And uh, you always feel better about it when somebody acknowledges it, don't you? Now, see, that's small, but it makes you want to do it more when people appreciate it. And uh, I think that God put that in you. Now, I want you to notice this in Hebrews 13 and verse number 15. It says, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Now, what I want you to see here is the connection between praise and thankfulness. Notice right here, he said, the fruit of our lips giving thanks, and we offer the sacrifice of praise to God. So thankfulness and praise are synonymous. So even when we come to church, our praise is our thankfulness being expressed to God. That's why you do it. It's not just so you can sing some songs and get in the mood. You know what I'm talking about? It is we come into the house of the Lord and we lift our hands, we lift our voices, and we enter into a, 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 a chorus with one another of thankfulness to God for His goodness. And so that's why, that's why you worship. Worship and praise is an expression of our thankfulness to God. And so sometimes if you just go to the Scriptures and you look up, verses on thanks or thanksgiving or thankfulness or whatever, uh, you'll miss a good portion of them because you don't look in a broad enough scope. Because every time you see praise, you're seeing the same thing in expression. Every time you see worship, you're seeing the same thing being expressed. It's people who are thankful to the Lord. So praise is a form of giving thanks. Thankfulness is, a pr thankfulness is expressed with praise worship, blessing the Lord. I had somebody, this has been a number of years ago now, but you know, they, they, you know, they, were, they were real super spiritual. And in the uh, book of Hebrews chapter seven, and it's, it's talking about the tithe and various things there through that passage. But one of the things it says is the less is blessed of the better. And so their conclusion was, since the less is blessed of the better, how presumptuous of us it would be to believe we can bless God. Well, why did the Bible say, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits? The Bible wants us to bless him. Now, if you, if you study that word bless, it means to speak well of or speak favorably about. Amen. And so when we bless the Lord, we're speaking well of him and we're speaking favorably about him. We're not condescendingly giving a blessing to him as if he needed us to be able to function. He's self-sufficient. He doesn't have to have what we have. But you know, the amazing thing is God wants us. And God allows us to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. And so we bless the Lord. So when you see blessing the Lord in scripture, that's what it's talking about. It's talking about being thankful unto him, being people who are, have a heart of thankfulness. This whole holiday that's set apart. I know in our secular world now, they tell us that it was the pilgrims who were being thankful to the Indians and that's why they had the feast. No, they weren't. They'd been dying. A bunch of them had been dying off. They were giving thanks to, the God, to God for his provision. So see, the secular mind does not want you to give thanks to God. Well, they don't even want to acknowledge that God even exists. So why would you give thanks to him? I heard one of our big politicians, if I called his name, you'd know it. I won't, out of courtesy, but it probably should be called. And in another setting, maybe it will be called. But the point is, is it happened very recently and there's some legislation passing across in front of where his sphere of influence and leadership is exercised. 
And his, his statement was, and it was something that wasn't very pleasing to Scripture and the God of the Bible. And he, this is his statement. I don't care what God thinks about it. Well, at least you're honest. You're stupid. But at least we know you. He doesn't care. Why? Well, you don't even believe in God. Why would you, why would you care what God thinks if you, give, if you don't acknowledge him at all? If you're an atheist, why would you care what God thinks? Well, see what he was telling in his particular political party, they are atheists. They struck God out of their whole, uh, their whole platform. So it's the party of the atheists of which he's one of the leaders. So why should we be surprised? But it's stupid. It's folly. We should care what God thinks. Amen. And so thankfulness is expressed with praise and worship and blessing the Lord. It's also uh, expressed through remembering, calling to remembrance the blessings. You remember David when he was discouraged? The Bible says that he, he set himself to the side and he rehearsed the goodness of God and encouraged himself in the Lord. Sometimes if you go back and encourage yourself with past victories, if you remember who God is and what God did, if you remember what Jesus did at Calvary, it's pretty easy to get encouraged. Amen. And so we go back and remember intentionally on purpose. And that's a part of our expressing our thankfulness to the God, to God, the God of the Bible, the God we serve. Amen. So we express our thankfulness by remembering who he is and what he does. We express it through exalting his power, his position, his exalted platform. The Lord is high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. I heard a little kid say that and said, what kind of train was it? <laughs> you know. Amen, kids. Wonderful, isn't it? It is. It's funny. But we speak about him lovingly. That's another way that we show thanks to the Lord, to speak good about him. See, that's how we bless the Lord. We speak favorably of him. And so uh, it's more than just saying, thank you, Lord. But now sometimes it's good to just say, thank you, Lord. The Bible gives us very clear instruction about thanking him over our meals. But that's only one area. But we should do that. Nor and I, we, I mean, we never eat without thanking the Lord for it. I mean, if it's nothing but a little, you know, energy bar or something, it, we just thank God for it. Thank you, Lord. You know, it's just a part of the habitual way. Now, when I say habitual, there's, there's a part of that that could be a little bit dangerous because we don't want to just serve God out of habit, but it's better to have the habit of serving them than to forget Him. Amen. It's better to have the routine than to not. And so we say, well, we've got to keep it meaningful. Well, we do. And we have to go back and remind ourselves sometimes that, you know, we need to take it as seriously as it needs to be taken. That's not just some mechanical something we pop out. But thank God, even if it's mechanical, we're still doing it. Amen. A lot of people forgot to do it. They don't even think it's important. But you know, every good and every perfect gift has come down from the Father above in whom is no shadow nor variableness of turning. Every good thing in your life came from the hand of the Lord. I don't care what it is. That job, that provision, that car you got here in, that home you go to, that place you live, the food you eat, it all came from the goodness of God. All of it. Amen. Amen. Praise God. We see over here in Psalms 100, the whole chapter here, it's a short chapter. But it says in verse 1, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before His presence with singing. And so here God wants us to come before Him in our thankful attitude with joy. We come with, with a, the expectancy and we come to Him with a vibrancy, not a long face, but with... See, it takes faith to have joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength. 
you can't give away your joy. You give away your joy, you give away your relationship with God. You give away your strength with God. God wants you to have joy about life. He wants to freely give you all things, he said. And he wants you to be thankful for it. He really does. And if people who learn thankfulness will see the blessing of God at new levels. Now, we don't thank him because we want to see his blessings. We thank him because we're thankful. But you can't substitute the fact that this leper who came back and give, gave thanks to the Lord, he, he was completely restored. He didn't ask for that. He got that. He asked for healing. And he, he got that. But he got so much more when he was thankful. Amen. And so when we show thanks to God and we're thankful people, that's where the blessing comes. That's where God... See, God's not, he's not desirous to hold out on you. God's desirous to bless you. The whole, the whole gospel message is the blessing of God. I mean, I mean, man's first, the very first words that man ever heard, Adam, the first man on the earth, the very first words that hit his eardrums were, be blessed, be fruitful, multiple. He never heard anything before he heard the blessing. That's the first thing he heard was the blessing of God sent to him. And God was a blesser then and God is a blesser now. And you position yourself, you create an atmosphere where the will of God, the blessing, the favor of God can come to you. Because if we act like we don't want the favor of God, we're just lying. We do want it. Everybody wants it if you're smart. Amen. I do. So it said, make that joyful noise unto the Lord. And serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord is God. And it is he that made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. So you enter into his presence when you give thanks. I'm talking about atmospheres where God works. The Bible says God inhabits the praise of his people. So when we praise, he inhabits. When we give thanks, we enter in. It all works together. So we're a thankful people, thankful, thankful for his goodness. And into his courts with praise, be thankful unto him and bless his name. Now, see, you know, that great theologian a number of years ago that told us that people couldn't bless the Lord. He forgot that verse. <laughs> we bless his name. I'm thinking, you know, when, and, 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 and he, was, he was saying it to me condescendingly, you know, correcting me. And I'm thinking, well, can't you read? This is not all that complicated. Just read this stuff, you know? So you know that somebody who says that is, is really telling you, you know, I know that they, they, they want to be superior. They want to speak down. They want to talk down to you. They want to correct you and tell you what to do. They just don't know the Bible. Amazing how knowing a little bit from the book will correct a whole lot of how you think. Amen. Say, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, bless the Lord O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. <laughs> and forget not all his benefits, <laughs> who healeth all thine diseases, iniquities, who forgives all thy, I'll get it right, forgives all thine iniquities and heals all thy diseases. And that's what he said. So he said, bless the Lord. Blessing the Lord is what creates the environment to get his healing and his forgiveness. That's where it flows from. Amen. <laughs> That's pretty good. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name for the Lord is good. That's why we say this here all the time. The Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. Well, why do you keep saying that? Because it's true. 
And we need to constantly remind ourselves that God is a good God. We serve a good God and he's for you. He's not against you. He's on your side and he'll take up residence with you if you'll give him the opportunity. Now, I'm telling you. And you let him move in. You let him move in and things start picking up. He don't live in a shack. <laughs> I want him in my house. Amen. So thankfulness creates an atmosphere where man and God communicate, interact, relate. That's what an altar is all about. An altar is a place where man and God do business. That's why we worship at the altar. Give thanks at the altar. You know, a number of years ago, it really wasn't anything ever initiated by me. But we had, a, we had this happen over a few service process, and, and people just started putting uh, their offerings on the altar, just in the service. I mean, wasn't anybody receiving an offering? They just started doing it. And it's like, wow, this is interesting. Well, you think about all the, you know, first-time visitors and things, and, you, you know, here's a leader. You think, God, man, people really get the wrong impression here. You know what I'm saying? And uh, so I decided I'm fixing this. We're not going to do this. And I come in here in my magnanimous, all-knowing stupidity, and I said, you know, we can't do that. Boy, in the Lord, I mean, you talk about convicting me. He said, he said, you didn't start it. You can't stop it. So that's why these baskets are up here and why people come. And, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, it's a place where people do business with God. You know, what I found that sometimes when people have a real a question in their mind about something in their spiritual life, in their, in, their, in their walk with God or maybe their family or whatever they're doing personally, somewhere in the, in the sermon they'll hear their answer. You know, and, and so, so we don't put any pressure on anybody to do that. That's just a thank offering. That's where you and God do your business. It's you and I'm not doing. I don't receive this as an. I don't do this, but I'm not going to stop this because I didn't start this. So there it is. You know, so it's just what it is, and and you know, you we we have discomfort sometimes because God's trying to draw us out a little bit. And we hadn't ever done that before, you know? And so it's like, wow. But if you do it to get money, you, know, you, you miss the whole point. I mean, you miss the whole point. I mean, we do receive offerings. And we do that intentionally on purpose, and we should. But this is something else. It's a thank offering. That's what, that's what we just call it. If you don't want to do it, don't do it. If you do want to do it, there it is. So that's up to you. You know. And, and I do. I do it every week. But I don't do it as a religious thing. I do it out of my lunch money. Nor gives me an allowance. There's something not right about that. I'm going to tell you right now. But uh, I found since I started participating in the thank offering, it never runs out. No, I'm telling you, I'm, I mean, it's amazing. It is really amazing. But that's another story, another day. But anyway, it is, it is true. But in Psalms 50... Um, you know, you really could read all the way down through uh, this chapter. I, I'm going to focus on verse 14 and 15. Um, but um, can you get Psalms 50 up on the screen? Just do a verse, go to all the way to verse 1, if you can, here. Um, it says, The mighty God, even the Lord, has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun unto the going down thereof. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. 
Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous around about him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Now that's you. You've made a covenant with God. And the sacrifice that you came with was the one paid on Calvary by Jesus Christ. That's your sacrifice. Amen. Next verse. And the heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God is the judge himself, say law. Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify against thee, I am God, even thy God. I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices or thy burnt offerings that have been continually before me. Now, that, that kind of gets you to, to what I want to, the point I want to make. They were bringing things to, the, to God. They were bringing sacrifices, animal sacrifices, according to the law, according to what God said, you know, bring a, a bull, a goat, a, a lamb, you know, they were bringing that to the Lord. And he said, uh, he, he, he went down here, go, go to verse 13, and we'll read there. He said, I will eat the flesh of bulls or drink the... He said, now, it's a question. Now, they're bringing those sacrifices to the Lord. And then he said, will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Well, the, that's a rhetorical question. The obvious answer to that is no. You know, God, <laughs> God's not eating the bull. So either bringing those animal sacrifices to the Lord... But then he went on to verse 14. That's what I want to take you to right here. He said, offer unto God thanksgiving. He said, you bring all this other stuff. He said, but the offering I want from you is the one that comes out of your heart. That thanksgiving for my goodness to you. Not forgetting what I've done. The bull, the goat, the heifer, the lamb, all that's got its place. He said, but the offering I want is that offering of thanksgiving. It comes from your heart. So he said here, verse 14 again, he said, offer unto God thanksgiving and pay thy vows unto the Most High. Now, the word vow actually um, is the word promise. Sometimes you read it and you, you, you know, you get real religious on it and it's only, it, the only, the only consideration really here. Now it could, it could represent a number of things. See, God calls in his promises. Now, what do I mean? He calls in his promises. You've ever, you've heard the saying, there are no atheists in foxholes. You, you, you ever heard, as long as there are tests, there will be prayer in school? <laughs> Same principle. Okay. Now, the reason that there are no atheists in foxholes is because there are some times, oh, my God, get me out of this. You know? And if he does, you hear people say these things. I told God if he'd get me out of this, I'd serve him. You just made a promise. Well, I forgot it. He didn't. You may have forgotten it, but he didn't forget it. It's a coming back. Uh huh. Well, it's been 10 years. He still didn't forget it. See, and that's what he's saying. He said, offer unto God thanksgiving and pay or make good on or fulfill your promises. If you promise God something, he didn't forget it. That's what he said. He said, you make good on it. <clears throat> now, see, sometimes you get that word vow and it gets over into, into money. And in vow giving is scriptural. Now, what, what, do you, what do you do? You make a pledge. So you understand what a pledge is. Well, we're going to build a building. And so, you know, within the next 
uh, 90 days, I'm going to give, you know, $100. Okay. Well, that's a pledge. That's a, that's, a, that's a faith offering. That's something that you committed to. It's a pledge offering. And that's very, very scriptural. Very scriptural. So that would be a vow. And so God's saying, if you made a vow, keep it. Because he remembers. But it doesn't have to be in the area of money. It's any promise you make with God. It's any, it's any terms or conditions that you set with God that he's honored. Lord, get me out of this combat situation and I'll serve you. And then people, you know, don't. But he's coming back. You say, well, I thought he'd forget it. No, he didn't forget it. You remember who you're serving here? He doesn't forget. You may want him to forget, but he's coming back. He wants, he wants the payment. Amen. 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 And call upon me in the day of trouble. Now notice what he said here. He said, when we come to him with thanksgiving and we keep our promises to him. And now notice in, in, in this 15th verse, the word and it is a connecting word. What that means is the thought is continuous. It wasn't one thought and now it's another. It is a continuation of what you just read. And if you do this and. Okay, so he said and call upon me in the day of trouble. What did he say he'd do? I will deliver thee. See, when we come with thanksgiving and we create the conditions that bring the deliverance from the trouble. God works in an atmosphere of thankfulness. Thanksgiving will bring him on the scene. It'll bring him right to where, where your challenge is. You begin to thank God for his goodness. You begin to thank God for what he's done for you in Christ Jesus. Begin to thank God for who you are in Christ, on and on and on. He said, when you do that, and you call upon me in time of trouble, I'll deliver you. And I'll deliver you to the point you'll end up having to glorify me and say, God did this for me. There's nobody else could have done it. I mean, nobody, can't nobody do you like Jesus. You know, I'm telling you, you know, I mean, that's a fact. Mm. And there's times in life, it's like, man, there's just no way out of this. And then all of a sudden, there's a way out. Every time. He always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. Every time, every situation, he's on the scene. Amen. Praise God. You go back here to this uh, book of Deuteronomy chapter, chapter 8. There's a whole lot here I could read, but for time's sake I won't and I can't. But God talked about certain conditions. When you've gone, gone into the land, you've eaten, you're full, you know, your blessings are overtaking you, you, you know, all kinds of things that I promised you have happened. He said in verse 10, he said, when thou hast eaten and are full, thou shalt bless the Lord for the good land which he hath given to thee. And so when you've eaten to the full, when you're enjoying the fullness of God, he gives us a warning. Verse 11, beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments. And so what he's saying here, remember, we said earlier, that just calling to remembrance or rehearsing or going back and reciting to yourself what God's done is a part of our thankfulness to the Lord. So he said, when I've, when I've done you good, when I've blessed your life, he said the caution for us is just not to forget it. Just don't forget it. Remember where it comes from. Remember God's goodness. Never forget. Amen. He said in verse 14, he said, then our heart be lifted up, and you forget the Lord. He said, you know, and he said that in, in, in terms of when your herds and your flocks multiply, your silver and gold is multiplied. Now, I don't think God will bless your money. Well, okay, I don't guess that was in there, but uh, he said he would. 
He said, just don't forget him. Everybody say, don't forget. Don't forget. Yeah, and so uh, verse 18, he said, but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that gives thee the power to get wealth. Well, that pretty well straightens it up. But it didn't mean wealth. It meant, you know, spiritual stuff. Well, why did he put silver and gold in there? Didn't he, can, he, can he read? God wants to bless you financially if you let him. And quit being too spiritual about this stuff so you just miss the obvious. Well, I believe it means spiritual riches. Well, just read the book. Amen. <laughs> Amen. For is he that giveth thee the power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear and thy fathers to give thee. So you got to remember that God is your provider, and you got to give thanks to him. That God is your healer. That God is your savior. That God is your deliverer. So all these things we have to remind ourselves. Amen. We find in Luke 22, verse 19. You, you with me? Yes. Am I taking too long? No. That's what I thought, but <laughs> I am a little biased. <laughs> Luke 22, verse 19. And he took bread and gave thanks. Well, that's Jesus. Now you think about this. This is Jesus, creator God. He took bread and gave thanks. He thanked the Father. Jesus thanked the Father. He took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in what? Remembrance. So every time that you receive communion, it's an act of thanksgiving. We remember Calvary. We remember the sacrifice. We remember the, the, the events that led to Calvary by his stripes we're healed. His sweat became as great drops of blood. Every time we remember that, it gives him glory. And we thank him for his goodness. Can you say a big amen? amen. Ephesians 5.20, it says, giving thanks always for all things unto God. So we give thanks all the time for everything. <laughs> That's exactly what it says. What do you give thanks for? Everything. When you do it, all the time. All the time, everything. Lord, we're out to eat. We don't pray in a restaurant. Well, that's one of those places. All the time. All the stuff. Of course you do pray in a restaurant. I wouldn't dare eat it. I got to eat this stuff. You kidding? Why do we pray over it? I got to eat it. You're not kidding me? I don't know what they did in the kitchen. <laughs> Amen. Psalms 26, 7. That I may publish. Publish means to give attention. That I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of his wondrous works. So the Bible says that we're to publish, give attention, speak aloud the voice of thanksgiving. So we give our mouth. Say thank you, Lord. See, I mean, it's simple, but Lord, thank you for a good night's rest. Sleep is a gift from God, you know. I mean, it is. Thank you, Lord, for a good night's rest. Thank you for this meal. Well, God will get mad at me if I don't thank him. No, no, no. That's the whole wrong motive. We thank him for his goodness. We don't thank him out of obligation. Now, if it takes obligation to get you there, but we thank him because we love him. We thank him because we're thankful. I think it does something to you. I think it's easy to be thankful to one another when you're thankful to God. I think it just changes your demeanor. You know, you're not as crotchety. You know, crusty. Cantankerous. Psalms 13, 6. I will sing unto the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Mm -mm -mm. Wow. God, your goodness. Oh, I just praise you, Lord, how great you are. 
The great, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Mm -mm -mm. God's goodness. Just to sit in his presence and speak of his goodness. What a joy. Here I am, Father, living in this beautiful home with a bossy wife. But <laughs> here I am, Lord, living in a beautiful home for real. I sit up here in my study that's got books from floor to ceiling. Every nice thing you can imagine in it that you gave me out of your good heart. God, it just rings you on the inside. I'm going to go out and get in a new car and drive to church where I can talk about Jesus. Paul said, I thank my God. He counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry. I'm not complaining about what I do. I'm rejoicing over what I do. You know, see that thankful attitude. I tell you, it'll break that ugly off of you. No joke. Amen. Psalm 92, 1. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High, to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night. You want to get out of the doldrums? That's the ticket. See, God works in an atmosphere of thankfulness. You want a visitation from God? Now, I'm not suggesting you're not thankful, but I think from time to time, it's Thanksgiving week. We ought to talk about it. Remind ourselves. When you sit down over that Thanksgiving meal, my God, there are people all over the world. They don't have this. <laughs> Look what you've done for me. You can gripe about what's going on in the world or you can give thanks for what you got. The best way to get out of what you don't have is to thank God for what you do have. Amen. Amen. I am, a, I, no, really, really, I am a thankful person. God. I might forget, but I don't forget much. Lord, your goodness. You are so great and greatly to be praised. You know, the last thing I say when I go to bed at night, I lay down and I put my head on the pillow and I say, I love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my soul, and with all my strength. And I love my neighbor as I love myself. He said, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So that's my confession when I put my head on the pillow. I love my God. And I love you. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I did not pay her to say that, but that's great. I mean, it's real too, you know, it is real. That's what makes church work. Church is not just a bunch of programs and stuff. Church is family. People who are in love with one another. That's why division is such a heartbreak. Because it's so not who we are. Breaks your heart. Because you love people. <laughs>